Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this morning, today's gospel from John chapter 8. In the name of Jesus, amen. Two of the enemies of freedom are complacency and presumption. When those two airplanes crashed into the Twin Towers 17 years ago, our nation was reawakened to the value and treasure of the freedom we have in this great land of ours. One can say that until September 11th, we as a people had succumbed, at least to some degree, to the twin enemies of freedom, complacency and presumption. We'd begun to think that freedom was a fortress that could never be assailed, that it would always stand without so much as a fight. We'd begun to think that freedom was ours by birthright and that no price would ever be required to keep it. And for a while afterward, freedom and the flag that represents it were once again exalted in this land God has given us. There was a resurgence of patriotism in America, and it was refreshing to see. More and more people were enlisting in the armed forces. The national anthem was proudly sung and duly honored at sporting events, and dozens of flags could be seen on neighborhood streets. Freedom was alive and well for the two enemies of freedom, complacency and presumption, had been pushed back. But as I said, that was 17 years ago. A lot has changed, and not in a good way. And on this Reformation Sunday, with the fervor of last year's 500th anniversary behind us, we must also wonder, has the exuberance for our freedom under the gospel fallen prey to these enemies as well? Observances all over the planet of the events of half a millennium ago reminded us of the great cost associated with the restoration of the gospel. But has the glory already in the 12 months hence started to fade? Or were we suffering Reformation fatigue even before the anniversary date arrived? I think that's more likely the case. It seems that the two enemies of freedom, complacency and presumption, chip away at our freedom in the gospel in the same way they erode the freedom we have in the temporal realm. When those two enemies slip in under the door, our freedom in the gospel is at risk, not because it's any less valuable or meaningful, but because it loses its luster in our eyes. When the shine has come off the silver, it's left moldering in the drawer. Have we as a church succumbed to the enemies of freedom? Have we as individuals in the inner workings of our own hearts been duped by the enemies of our freedom under grace? Are our consciences bruised by the guilt of our sin because we've doubted the power of the gospel to heal us? Are we in need of a new reformation? so that as freely and joyously as we once flew our American flags, we might freely and joyously wave the banner of the church, of Christ, of the cross, and the gospel. Consider, if you will, how easily freedom under the gospel is lost to complacency and presumption. In today's gospel, some Jews who had followed Jesus, who even believed in him, questioned him about being free. He said to them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So clearly Jesus offered them the freedom only grace can give, born as it is in the word of truth. 
But how did they respond? We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? They presumed that their freedom before God was guaranteed because of their birthrights. So they didn't really feel the guilt of their sins, nor did they realize the bondage their sins had put them in. They had apparently forgotten, as Jesus will remind them in a minute, that whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. So they took for granted that they were free because their forefather Abraham was free. In presuming a freedom before God because of the quality of their birth, they lost their freedom before God because they ignored their sins and felt no need for Christ or the gospel. From first century Jerusalem, we can fast forward 1,500 years and see that by the time of the Reformation, freedom under the gospel was all but dead. Certainly at the time, the gospel wasn't silenced because of presumption or complacency. In fact, the people would likely have given anything for a word of gospel, a word of forgiveness, a word of reconciliation to God. But it was in, in those intervening years, the, the centuries leading up to the Reformation, that the church began taking for granted what it had been given by God, namely the power to forgive penitent sinners by bestowing on them the love of God guaranteed in the cross of Christ and distributed freely in, the, in his holy word and sacraments. In other words, the church took the gospel the forgiveness of sins in Christ for granted. Presumption and complacency had worked like a tarnish to conceal the glimmering truth of salvation. By the time of the Reformation, the gospel was seen as a secondary gift of God. Of greater importance to the church in those days was the intent of the spiritual pilgrim to live a life pleasing to God. This effectively ripped salvation from the hands of God and plunked it squarely into the hands of those least able to accomplish it. Listen to Luther explain what he witnessed in the tragic so-called spiritual pilgrimage of a young monk. With these eyes of mine I saw when in my 14th year I attended school at Magdeburg, a prince of Anhalt, who went about in a friar's cowl on the highways begging bread and carried a bag like a donkey. The bag was so heavy that he had to stoop. But his fellow friar walked by his side without a burden, so that the pious prince was sure by himself to serve the world as a perfect example of the gloomy, shorn holiness of monasticism. They had also crushed him, that he did all the other works of the cloister like any other brother. He had fasted, kept vigil, and mortified his flesh so rigorously that he was the picture of death, mere skin and bones. In fact, he soon died for he could not bear so strenuous a life. If I told you today that there's no freedom in Christ, that there's no hope in the cross, there's no promise of life in the resurrection, certainly you would rightly rise to arms to defend the gospel and the freedom you enjoy under it. But if I preach to you the gospel in all its purity, that Christ has suffered the penalty for all your sins, that he's atoned for everything you've ever done or will do against his commandments, that he's risen from the dead to prepare a place for you on that glorious day of the resurrection of all flesh, if I proclaim these things to you, you, by God's grace, must guard the treasure that complacency and presumption persistently strive to steal from you under cover of darkness. 
For these enemies of freedom, left unchecked, will rob you blind. If you abide in my word, Jesus said, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Though complacency and presumption are the enemies of freedom, the word of God, including the truth of the gospel, is the church's great defense and glorious confidence. Beloved, don't let the gospel be taken from you. Don't let it be substituted with psychobabble or principles for holy living, no matter how pious such principles may sound. Don't let the gospel be shackled by those who are ashamed of it or bored with it or who are ill-prepared uh, Ill to proclaim it. And I dare say, do not let the gospel in song be substituted for trite lyrics of how you feel or rhythms that put a little boogie in your backside. Do not let the gospel be taken from you. In his great hymn of the Reformation, Luther wrote, the word they still shall let remain, nor any thanks have for it. He's by our side upon the plain with his good gifts and spirit. The word of which Luther speaks is the only begotten incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, who has come in the flesh. This word, my friends, is the word that has set you free. And if you are free in him, you are free indeed. That is the promise of the gospel. No sin can bind you, no devil can assail you, no grave can haunt you, and no trouble can destroy you. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In the fullness of time, God sent his son into the world to live a perfect life in your stead and then to stretch out his arms on a cross so that the sins of which you are guilty might be atoned for by him. God raised him from the dead that the promise of life and the resurrection would be yours. He set him at his own right hand, where he rules the universe with power, giving even temporal freedom through the hand of governments, and where he rules the church with grace, giving himself again and again in bread and wine for, those, or for the life of those who confess his holy name. Brothers and sisters, as you leave here today, Look for the flags waving on your drive home and thank God that complacency and presumption haven't completely driven our appreciation for temporal freedom out of us. But more than that, thank God for the freedom of living in the gospel of his grace. And by that grace, given in the word of truth, do not let anyone Take that gospel from you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.